The notion that you should be able to strip throw as much as you bench or you're unbalanced is fucking stupid. And that's really something that needs to die. Also, the idea that you need to fucking row twice as much as you bench in terms of frequency is also stupid. So like you're saying, if I do 20 sets of pressing a week, I should do 40 sets of rowing. Good fucking luck with that. Like, first of all, unless you have a weak ass bench press, you're not going to be able to row anywhere near what you bench press even for reps. Um, and then likewise, I don't know what kind of time y'all have or what kind of insane joint resiliency that you have to be able to do fucking 40 sets of rowing per week, but good fucking luck with that too. What you wanna keep in mind is balance. That's what that fucking cue and perennial truth is trying to propagate, but it's not doing a good job of it. What is a good best practice in terms of rowing and pressing is make sure that if you press, you have some sort of pull to be associated with it. It could be a one-to-one, -one, it could be a two-to-one, so two presses, one pull. You just want to have something where you're working that opposing musculature and that you're increasing strength and performance with that pulling over time. Is it going to be anywhere near your bench press? More than fucking likely not. But if you're bench pressing 350, and you can do like seal rows with 225 for a set of eight. You have a pretty balanced pressing and pulling ratio, in my opinion, just practically. That's the opinion piece for today. Y'all let me know how you think about my opinion. We're gonna get in to the uh, Q&A. So that's my opinion piece that we're gonna start this Q&A off with, and you can tell me how y'all feel about that. Be cordial, so. If you act like a nerd in the comments, I'm gonna call you one. Be nice to each other. Um, first question this week. I hate squats, can I just do Romanian deadlifts for quads? No, so a Romanian deadlift is, so there's a squat hinge continuum. So towards this end, more squatty. Towards this end, it's more hingy. Romanian deadlift is literally on the opposite end of the squat hinge continuum. A proper Romanian deadlift or stiff-legged deadlift doesn't recruit your quads at all. Now, I think you should still do stiff-legged deadlifts just because in my opinion, since they're on the edge, like the exact opposite end of that squat hinge continuum, they're a fantastic posterior chain builder. So still do them, but I would ask you, why do you hate squats? Do you hate squats because you lack the mobility to do them properly? Do you hate squats because you're terrible at them? Why do you hate them? Do you hate squats because they hurt? Okay, if you answer yes to any of those questions, why is that? There's always something that you can do to improve your rep quality, your mobility, or you can just get stronger over time and just do squats anyway because you suck at them. And when you get better at them, you like them more. There's almost no reason why you shouldn't do some sort of squatting pattern. So if you answer no to all of those things and you just don't do squats, so let's just say hypothetically, you can squat 600 pounds and you just don't like squatting, all right, bro, in that case, I guess you could do a hack squat, Smith machine squat, um, lunges, but the fact remains that any, any, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm, not, I'm trying not to use a galaxy brain term. Any form deficit or any area of opportunity that you have in your squats that is preventing you from enjoying them in the begin, to begin with, that's gonna manifest in every other leg movement that you do. So if you don't like squats because your quads are weak as shit, you're not gonna like hack squats, you know what I mean? Like, they're all quads and hack squats, so. Do what you like, but don't do stuff just because you're not good at it, you know what I mean? It's more of a reason for you to be doing it. The next question, is there any downside to splitting a session into AM and PM sessions? Um, it depends, so if we're talking like splitting upper body into or like a full body into an upper and lower session on the same day, I don't recommend that just because you're gonna stress your body out so much. And I'm not gonna get into all the science behind that, but when you work out, you get into like a, I don't even know the giga brain term for it, but I think it's called the sympathetic state where like your nervous system is activated. You doing that twice a day for no extra benefit other than, you know, you get to eat and have a post-workout meal twice. I don't think it is worth it just because it's going to burn you out more over time. But like if you're, you're breaking up like your regular weight training and then like abs or cardio or something, I guess that's fine. I don't see any benefit in it. 
even if you're doing it because you're like limited on time in your schedule, so you only have this amount of time in this time block to train and this amount of time here, and that's why you're breaking it up. I would just look at training more effectively and doing more giant sets, drop sets, and things like that to save on time. You can get in a good training session in like an hour and a half, hour 15 minutes, despite what some uh, Monica Lewinsky's might tell you. Um, Zerchers versus normal deads and squats. Zerchers are a good exercise. I think that they are classified as their own movement pattern, so they're neither a deadlift or a squat. So if you see someone that Zercher squats, um, any amount of weight and they don't do any leg exercises, they don't do any hip hinges, it's very likely that their Zercher squat is higher than their regular squat or their regular deadlift. Reason being is like I said, it has no carryover to a squat or a deadlift. On the other hand though, if you get really brolic at squats and deads, you're gonna have a really high Zercher squat. So look at the individual Eric Bugenhagen that made odd lifts popular to begin with. He didn't get strong doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like he didn't he didn't start off by doing the odd lifts, bro. Like he he built a big foundation of strength doing basic barbell exercises. He had like a, a 600 something competition deadlift and almost a 400 pound bench press before he did any odd lifts. So because he built such a huge foundation doing that, when he decided he wanted to do odd lifts and just get crazy strong at them, he was already throwing up impressive numbers on those lifts, you know what I mean? It doesn't work the other way around. So if you build fucking uh, 600 pound behind the back deadlift, you might not be able to deadlift 450 pounds conventional, you know what I mean? Like, track back to what, uh, I think his name was Not Strong Enough. He was kind of a shit poster in a lot of ways, but he was strong and he said the same thing. He's like, dude, I did like odd lifts and had no carry over to anything. And then when I started doing conventional exercises, I got stronger and bigger. So do them if you want to get better as urchers, but just know that they don't have carry over to anything else. Might have just pissed off all the odd lift enjoyers, but I'm just I'm just keeping it a buck because we've all collectively focused on the odd lifts at some point because of Eric Bugenhagen, and I'm just being real with you. Thoughts on conditioning with the goal of increasing work capacity. So, conditioning in a strength and conditioning program doesn't need to be anything really outside of what you do in the weight room potentially if you really wanted to get super minimalist with it. So. I made a community post the other day where I said uh, I finished my workout in like an hour, 15 minutes. That's not including my warm up. So I, I, I like to warm up for about 10, 15 minutes and then get straight into my, my weight training. And there were some people that were like, there's no way you finish your workout in an hour, 15 minutes, you're fucking lying. Like one, no I'm not, I could like time, time lapse my workout and make a video out of it if I care to prove it to you, but if you delegate your training session such that you have your main work where you're resting more, so it could be like four minutes, five minutes between sets, that'd be like three or four sets, and then everything else, you're super setting and then resting less, because here's the thing, guys, you only really need to rest more than like a minute or two if it's a movement that's very heavily loaded relative to everything else you're doing in your program. So like. I'll rest four or five minutes between sets on squats or bench press or heavy, heavy RDLs because they're heavy. They're the most weight that you're doing in a program. They're your primary exercises. And you're only doing like between three and five sets of them at the most, right? Everything else is like dumbbell bench, weighted push-ups, uh, pull-ups, rows. You can, first of all, superset or giant set all of those things together and then rest two minutes after you complete the giant set. That may even look like doing like some uh, slow stationary biking in between your sets as the rest portion of it, just to get your legs warm if you have, you know, like any pain in your knees. And you could use that as it's gotta get ahead of the curve in terms of rehabbing anything. There's a lot of different ways you can add conditioning to your program. It could look like combining all those things with high rep sets. So high rep sets burn calories proportionately to the amount of weight that you lift. So if you 
you know, have a 150 pound bench press that you can do for three sets of 10, if you get that to 300 for three sets of 10, you're gonna burn twice as many calories proportionally because you have to do twice as much as work. It's just how it works. That being said, the higher rep sets do burn more calories and you know require you to do more work than the lower rep sets. So if you have a day where, say for example, if you're on a DUP type program where you're doing lower reps here and higher reps here, this could be your like your conditioning type day. There's a lot of different ways you could do it, man, but you don't have to do anything extravagant. It's just really how you organize your existing training. That was a great question, by the way. Thank you for that. How important do you think it is to be able to program for yourself? So I've replied in the comment to this. That's the entire premise of my channel, you know what I mean? Like, I'm meant to be a bridge that separates you from being lost in the sauce and not knowing what the fuck you're doing and being able to, you know, program for yourself and potentially help someone else if that's what you wanted to do. That being said, I obviously think it's very important for you to be able to make programs for yourself. So what that it looked like is just being able to do a few simple things. So be able to map out a clear, measured map of progression where you start off week one here and week eight here, and then you cycle through it over and over again. If you can do that and then be able to see clear recovery patterns in your workout, like where the stimulus is highest and lowest and where you're using this period for recovery, where your progressions are, where you need to rotate exercises and where you focus on certain things versus others. So you might have a block where you focus on accumulating hypertrophy. One might be work capacity, one might be strength and so on. Like if you can identify all those things, it's like the bare minimum of, of what makes a good program. So I think that was another question and we'll go into more detail with that. But if you can figure out how to map out all those things, bro, you'll never need a coach ever, provided that you can be objective. Where a lot of people end up getting coaches is that they, one, don't know what they're doing, two, know what they're doing and they can't just be objective with themselves, or three, they just need someone to hold them accountable. All those things are very valid. That's why I'm here for those type of individuals. But most people don't need a coach. Most people can hold themselves accountable. They're very disciplined and they're objective with themselves. They just don't know what the fuck they're doing. That's where I come into play. Um, next question. How to get generally strong aesthetic and condition. So this is kind of like part two of the conditioning question that we got, just because through me telling, through him telling a little story about himself, he, he basically came to the conclusion of, you know, I just want to be a general badass. I want to be big, strong, fast, lean, and capable. So you can't have your cake and eat it too, but that doesn't mean you can't be all those things at once. You just have to build those capacities like a baseline of each of those capacities at different portions. So you can train maybe one or two of those things at the same time, but for the most part, you can't optimally train any of those things all together all at once. You can maintain a decent level all at once, but that's different. So I would recommend, say, having a phase where you focus on just general strength and hypertrophy. Then another phase where it's more you know, conditioning-based and you're just maintaining strength and hypertrophy. And then once you build you know, a decent work capacity, then you can start to maintain all of those things at once, doing things that we talked about in that first question regarding conditioning. Um, next question. I do RDLs and bent over rows for my posterior chain. What place do back extensions have in this program? Would it be for strength or hypertrophy? Now, I can talk a little bit about the way I train personally. I don't train any competition movements. I do have movements that are delineated by heavy accessory and assistance and so on. So I, you can use back extensions in a lot of different ways. These days, I prefer to use them as a hypertrophy tool um, just because squats are more so like my strength-based movement, like the reverse safety bar squats are my strength-based movement. I think back extensions have a lot of utility overall. They're like a jack of all trades movement, in my opinion. So they're really good for just preparing your posterior chain to be able to do whatever it is you, you, set, you set out to do in the training program that day. 
they're really good for hypertrophy. I feel my lower back on very few exercises like I do on back extensions. They're good for just having a movement where you can get a good stimulus out of a very relatively minuscule amount of weight. They're good for bodybuilding. So they're good for using things like myo reps, really fucking slow tempos. They're just overall really good. If you're already doing bent over rows and Romanian deadlifts, I don't know what the rest of your training program looks like, but I would just caution you against throwing them in there. So like if you already notice that you're getting a good stimulus from your Romanian deadlifts and they're not taking away from your other shit that you're doing, perfect. If you want to do back extensions, swap those out. Don't just throw the back extensions in too because then you might be doing too much. Especially if you're doing bent over rows, which have you in that deep stretch position with your hamstrings and your lower back and your ass throughout a prolonged period of time. So you might be in a, a deep stretch position in your hamstrings for like a minute. If you're doing Romanian deadlifts on top of that, you might find that you overtrain your high hamstring and then that's how you, you get you know butt cheek snaps and all that. So give and take, but it, it is a good movement. Uh, big Smoke asks he never asks any questions so i had to make sure to answer this one how come i don't feel my triceps in any pressing movement it's a good question man so dr mike talks about how he biases his squat movement patterns such that it's a majority of quads and it's just evident in the way that he squats versus how he used to so he used to use every muscle possible to like move the weight up and down, which is not wrong. It's not even wrong for hypertrophy, like general strength and hypertrophy. But if you're looking to just recruit a certain muscle, the mind-muscle connection comes into play and in how you orient your body and how strict you are with your rep quality. It may just be a situation where you need to be more mindful of what your triceps are doing and where your arms are at. So if they start to flare out, even if you're close grip, yeah, your triceps are going through a bigger range of motion, but because they're not tucked in, they're not really getting recruited the same way as if they were tucked in, you know what I mean? Even if you do that sometimes, bro, like I never really feel my triceps doing anything, but you know, they're very well developed and I don't do really any isolation work other than the tricep rope pushdowns that I just started doing recently. Um, if it's an instance where you know you hear that you're like okay i know they're technically working because i'm doing a bench press but i still want to feel them that's where the isolation can come into play so i really like tricep rope pushdowns i never really do any tricep isolation until recently just because i felt that any additional tricep isolation was just overtraining my arms and my elbows but i really like those there's just something about them where they're almost therapeutic i guess you could say as long as you don't do too much of it um, my boy, Sam Sheether, this was a great question and I think it's going to be uh, good food for thought for everybody just to, you know, prevent some things from happening in the future. He asked shoulder external rotation work, nicety or necessity? And I replied saying, you know, just working every function of the shoulder in general, um, is something that you should be doing in every capacity. I made a video talking about this called, I think like bald Chad, uh, douchey shirtless lecture or some fucking ridiculous title. But in there I talked about, you know, some shoulder and chest discomfort that I was having because I wasn't working every angle and every function of my shoulder. I wasn't overhead pressing and I wasn't doing any uh, horizontal rowing. And because of that, I was noticing some shoulder discomfort. That's something that I make sure to include in my own programs. It's just like slap on the wrist. I always include every function of, you know, where you could move or pull or push in all my clients' programs for the most part. But in my own, I just, you know, you get, you get caught up in the, uh, the flow of training and such, and I just wasn't doing certain things. But I really think it's important to be able to move in every angle, including diag diagonally and in a transverse plane, just because it keeps certain strength curves strong, I guess you could say. You're only as, as strong or as stable as you are in your weakest position. And no, you can't bulletproof everything, but just in your warm up, even, just fucking doing IYT raises and then some rear delt rows and then rowing through every 
which angle. This is something that I do in my warm up. So I'll get a dumbbell and you see how my arm is going through every angle that it can. Doing stuff like that, doing stuff like the external rotation in your warm ups, internal rotation. All that is just gonna keep your, your shoulder loose, I guess you could say, if you don't get in, wanna get in any giga brain terminology. That's gonna prevent over time. You call it the, um, what do you call it, Sam, in your um, videos? You call it the accumulation of small benefits, I think, something like that. That's so, that's so true and so key just to, you know, overall progression. So if you have a tiny benefit that's added up over 100 workouts, it suddenly becomes this magnified fucking thing to where like, if this is what separates you from hurting yourself or not, you're gonna wish that you did that little bit here, 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 and here. You know what I mean? And it's not anything hard. You may feel similar, but that's how I feel about it personally. Um, what makes a good program in your opinion? So, I replied in the comments if I look at it and I just don't immediately fucking uh, get angry or disgusted or roll my eyes. Um, but it's not a whole lot at a minimum that goes into a good program. So a good program, I should be able to see where it starts and where it ends or what the premise of it is, like a thread of progression. So I should be able to see, okay, week one, you progress here, here, and here, and here's how you do it. A lot of people fucking overshoot, like do too much weight or do too many reps or do too much this and that because they're not planning out reasonable progression in their training program. A lot of you guys want to put weight on an exercise and don't see where you should have done these things first before you try to add weight to this exercise. It's where we have people thinking that you can't bench 225 in five years of training. That's fucking bullshit. Bro, like, let's just say step loading, like, like what I say is a, a way that you can periodize your training. You should have it such that you're only adding weight to like a one rep max or like a top set of five or whatever. If you've already accumulated this much volume and progressed in your hypertrophy work to be able to earn that progression. And you should be able to see that in the training program. That's the first thing. The second thing is the order of your exercises. It, and you don't, you don't know what you don't know. So I'm not talking shit or anything like that, but if someone, you know, comes to me or comes to someone else and they say I have trouble increasing my squat or my deadlift and I just see that your training program is something like exercise one bench press exercise two dumbbell bench press exercise three incline bench press exercise four tricep pushdowns I can see why you're not fucking increasing your bench press because your first three sets of four sets of bench press are quality work you work in the same movement pattern right after, it's gonna be fatigued from your main work. And you haven't given your pressing muscles any rest in between that to be able to put up a decent performance in your second press. And you fucked up there. You fuck up again by doing another press again where you're definitely super fatigued and you're using baby weights compared to your first bench press variation. You see what I mean? So, exercise selection order. I should be able to see what is the main exercise of the day what are the antagonist movements? So with a bench must come a pull and have that pull between each pressing exercise. If I don't see that, I'm like, here's an easy fix that you can make that's gonna boost your performance and your hypertrophy by itself, changing nothing else in your program. Another thing is, so we covered like the thread of progression and the exercise order, it's exercise selection. If you're someone that is, you know, you're doing all those things and you don't notice that you're getting the results that you want, you may want to look at your actual exercise selection. If you notice that you have a sticking point and it's not being addressed somewhere in either the quality of your main work or in your accessories, you're fucking up. I have a resource, a free resource in my struggler program um, called the, uh, it, it's called like the struggler's guide to selecting exercises. It goes through bench, deadlift, overhead press, I think weighted pull up and squats as well, showing you different exercises that you could use depending upon what, what you need particularly. That is completely free. I'm always gonna refer people to that first if they have a question about exercise selection. Those are the main things though, man. Like if you can do those three things, you have a good program. Where you get excellent programming is where you start to get into the, all the minutia, all the different tools and periodization styles that you can use. But that's another topic. 
What would you do to increase stability on bench press? And he talked about um, like one, one of his shoulders comes off the bench. First of all, you might not be evenly laying on the bench, bro, to be honest with you. That's what it kind of sounds like. But just in general, I'm going to refer you to my um, final answer to bench press cues video that I just made. You want to make sure that you're, uh, if you're not using leg drafts, so if you're using a Larsa press, that you still have good engagement with the bar in your upper body. So your scaps are depressed. And what you do by that is you just fucking imagine crunching the bar in half. Freaky D uh, calls it breaking the bar in half. I call it breaking a Kit Kat bar. You break the Kit Kat bar, your lats get engaged. That's going to depress your scaps. That's going to also put them in a neutral position, which I talk about, which is very key to not fucking your shoulder up, despite what some of you nerds tried to argue with me about. Look, man, I don't, you know, do what the fuck you want to do. You could bench in your fucked up shitty form if you want to. I'm just trying to tell you that, like, anatomically, that's not smart. So if it works for you, it works till it doesn't. Enough said. But it also gets them in that new, nice neutral position to where you'll have an opportunity to retract and build that stability in your upper back on the uh, eccentric. Um, so that's just in terms of upper body engagement, like tightness. Another thing that you could do is, um, some people don't like this, depending on the person, I don't either, but you can give yourself a double chin on bench press. What that'll do is it'll force you to lay on your neck and your traps, which is just good for setting up a good starting position on bench press in terms of like your upper body musculature. So like the waist up. Um, another thing is, I guess you could technically say that your lower back is included in that waist up musculature. Making sure that that is engaged and that your ass is flexed. That's going to pretty much take care of you in terms of everything that you'll need in stability. Failing leg drive. Now, watch that video for an explanation on cueing leg drive. But leg drive would just be another thing that you do to, to stay tight and not have any power leaks, any stability leaks, anything like that that would prevent you from sliding over all over the place on bench press. Now, if you're just benching on a shitty baby dick thin bench, my recommendation is going to be, quite honestly, bro, even if at your, you're at a commercial gym, just buy a fucking bench that you, that you use that you may put in the back or whatever and using that. Or if you can't do that or you don't have the money to or you don't want to, you get, lay a band across the bench and then that'll help somewhat with the stability. Um, last question of the week and y'all can leave your questions about these questions down below. Any accessories to aid in squat depth? So. I call it the chicken wing stretch. Um, I guess I could flip up something on the screen demonstrating it, but you kind of just sit down on the floor and you know, you got your legs in like a chicken wing position and you just rotate them back and forth. That's really good if you're lacking any mobility in your internal and external rotation and that's just your ability to go in and out with your legs, giga brain term. Um, if you just generally lack mobility in your hips and in your ankles, getting into something like a ATG goblet squat and just holding it for time is really good. That'll give you some temporary mobility that you can then use to just squat with more mobility. You could do that in between sets in your warm ups, and then even like in between your working sets as well. A goblet squat is not fucking heavy. If you get like a 30 pound dumbbell and then sit at the bottom of a squat after a working set for a few seconds, it's not gonna like fucking snap anything. More than likely. Um, another one that you can do is a psoas curl. Um, it's just basically working your hip flexors. You could do the hanging knee raises. That'll work your hip flexors as well. Um, and that should really cover you, man. Failing just getting a... Um, a nice squat shoe. I know you said that high bar squats tend to use your lower back a lot. Try a mid bar position. So you're using a low bar squat now. Move it up just a tiny bit, like an inch or two below your high bar. And for what most people find is that putting the bar in that position on their back puts the bar more in line with the center of their gravity. So that may help you as well. 
Um, and then another one that may help you is the couch stretch. And there's regressions of that that you can uh, Google that would help you out. Now, an important thing that you're going to want to make sure that you do to maintain this flexibility is just include them as, in, as part of a good warm-up uh, regimen. So you include all that shit in your warm-up. Uh, you could include things like tibialis raises, calf, calf raises, things like that, all in, all in the warm-up, and that'll help you out as far as your squat depth. Great questions this week, y'all. If you have any questions about these questions or any comments about my opinion on the row, I'm opening up that forum of discussion. Be civil. Y'all have a good one. Peace.